Well, hello there, and a lovely big warm welcome to our webinar this morning. Uh, in just a moment, I am going to be getting um, Peter Wild and Sally Cathcart on the call. So if you just bear with me for a moment, I am gonna go and uh, get those two people in the room uh, because then we will, be, we will be pretty much good to go. Um, but just in the meantime, we are here today to, um, we have the great honor of having Peter Wild, uh, who is the Associate Chief Examiner at, uh, at Trinity College London. He's going to be taking us on a whistle stop tour through um, Trinity's grades six to eight. And uh, Sally and I have just been speaking to him and we know that we have, um, we've got eight pieces uh, to look forward to. He's gonna be taking us through eight pieces. So, um, hello Sally. Hello there. How are you this morning? I'm good this morning. Thank you so much, Sharon. Good. Okay, out there is good. I can see we've already got 17 people joining us, which is fantastic on this rather damp morning where we are. And uh, I'm sure Sharon's already said, but if you just want to, uh, and there's Peter, um, just would like to pop in where, uh, where you're calling from, because I think this might be a worldwide, hopefully, webinar that we're having here. Let's, let's <coughs> wait and see. So, Sharon. Absolutely. Well, listen, I just want to say hello to Peter, um, who has uh, popped up on our screens as well. Good morning, Peter. How are you this morning? Now, he's muted at the moment. So, Peter. Um, I'll sort that. There, there you go. There you are. Okay. May I speak now? <laughs> yes, you may speak now. We can hear you now. I'd like to say good morning to all of you, Sally, Sharon. I've already spoken to Sharon. It's great to be with you again. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, we can see that people are hopping in all the time. And again, folks, just as you're joining us, please type into the chat. Uh, let us know whereabouts you are listening from. Um, and we will... Just go over there in a moment and we will um, be shouting out uh, a big hello. Oh, fantastic. Our first person, Emily, has hopped in and she says, hello, I'm here from New Zealand. Uh, wow. It's, fantastic. It's probably quite late in New Zealand. It's lovely to have you with us, Emily. Um, we have Fiona, who's listening in from Oxford in the UK. Sally, that's just down the road from where you are. Indeed it is. Up the road even. Up the road. I'm just going to just say, make sure you type into all panellists and attendees. Otherwise, we are the panellists and we are the only people who get to see you. So you just need to change a little bit, um, some of you, that you're typing. There we go. All panellists and attendees. So welcome. Oh, I've lost my screen. Lovely. Okay, so we have uh, Megan, uh, who is listening in today from St. Leonard's on Sea in East Sussex. We have Sarah Jane Cross, who is uh, saying hello from West Somerset. We have Simon from Sandhurst, mm -hmm. um, who says, hello, Peter, hope you're well. So I check it, I can't see Simon. Simon, Simon yeah. Locke. Yeah. Simon Locke. Um, he was a student of mine many years ago. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Lovely to have you on the call, Simon. Uh, we have Alison. Um, he's listening in from Worcester. We have Emma from Hook in Hampshire. We have Yvonne. He's listening from uh, Hinkley. We have Poppy from Leicester, Julie from Chessington, uh, Mary from St. Leonard's on Sea. We've got somebody from Ballymena, not far from you, Sharon. Uh, right. Hello to Jane in County Antrim. And so they keep coming in, which is great. So just keep popping your names in there. But we do want to get on as quickly as possible and uh, hand this over to Peter. So uh, I think we'll just let you just continue to put your names in, anybody else who comes <laughs> along. Sharon. Okay, so as I have uh, just said earlier on, Peter has got eight pieces, um, grades six to eight, to take us through this morning. Uh, the format's going to be he will play a little bit. Um, obviously, because they're more advanced level pieces, um, he's not going to be playing them in their entirety. We just don't have time for that this morning. But he is going to be, you can see, he is sitting beside uh, a lovely piano this morning. So he is going to be playing. And he's going to be talking a little bit. And meanwhile, we would like you to ask your questions. So keep those questions coming because at the end of each piece, we're going to be going over to Peter. We're going to be giving him your questions uh, before we move on to the next piece, rather than holding all the questions to the end. 
So um, if you've also got your book, I can see Sally's holding up uh, her copy here. Um, now is a good time to go and get that if you yep. haven't got them in front of you. <laughs> Lovely. And I'm just going to say hello to Louise, who's also listening in from County Antrim uh, today. Welcome, Louise. Okay, Peter, we're going to hand over without further ado to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Sharon and good morning to everybody. So I'm going to select three pieces from each of grade six and seven and then two pieces from the grade eight book and uh, we can look at uh, what elements uh, are needed to bring music alive such as choice of tempo, dynamic, tonal colouring, articulation, balance of texture, phrase structure, phrase shape and where appropriate use of pedal or pedals. And these are all the necessary ingredients uh, which are needed to interpret and communicate the music so that we bring that performance, as I said a moment ago, alive. Okay, so with um, no further ado, let's have a look at grade six, and I've chosen for my first piece, progression one, which is on page 14. So this is a piece which requires oh a tremendous amount of verve and energy and confidence um, in a performance. Uh, it particularly needs very care, great care with the articulation and also with a recognition of the structure of the piece so the sections are very clearly defined. So I'm going to just play you the first section just to give you a flavour of the style. energizing uh, moment that is. So we can hear straight away that choice of tempo is vital in a piece like this. It's marked to be played in a duple meter, it's 2-2 two, two time, so there's no point in thinking of applauding sort of one, two, three, four in performance. It's got to go like a racing car. It's got to be a good sense of one, two, one, two, and that must be felt throughout the performance. And to give it that edginess, that attitude almost, it's necessary to place the articulation and accentuation with great sort of care. You'll notice that a lot of the piece, a lot of the style of music, it rests on the ability to define the syncopation. So immediately, if we look just at the first two bars of the piece, we can hear a lot of what this music is about. <laughs> So there we have a syncopated fourth crotchet in the first bar, which preempts moving into the second bar and gives you that sense of uneasiness almost. I use the word attitude. I think it's a great uh, word to describe this piece. And it's not just because of the syncopation, it's actually the tonality. It's very much rooted in an A minor tone of center. And going to the D major chord, gives it that real sense of, I don't know, edginess, I think is another good word to describe this. When we have syncopations, it's important that the hands are coordinated precisely, so we want good hand independence. Just for a moment, I'm going to put down the lid of the piano, because the best way you can start off teaching this piece is by actually tapping out the rhythm on a hard surface just to get that sense of combining the hands at the right time. And with that, start to introduce the accentuation. Ah, all of that can actually be, if you like, prepared before the student looks at the notes of the piece. I don't think you're really meant to hit a, a Steinway grand piano, so I hope I'm forgiven for that. But these are sort of things, because it's so rhythmically bound up to that rhythm, it's going to come in each section, the student needs to be absolutely on top of that before they can go on and think about putting this together. So let's have a look at the first section again. Listen out for the accentuation on the last crotchet of the bar, and then particularly listen to the way that the composer uh, Schmitz has gone into a sort of hemiola type effect at the end of line two. 
So if anybody thinks they're getting uh, a little bit bored at the end of the first line, this is going to bring it to life again. It, it excites our senses. I'm going to go on a little bit further. And perhaps you could listen to what happens to the left hand in the second section, the way he develops the star through a different left hand pattern. accentuation on the second line. <laughs> Suddenly, again, we start to listen. And then the left hand breaks up and develops into broken octaves. Here, the left hand must retain that staccato articulation throughout. And then look at the way at the bottom of the first page, those broken octaves start to change into a different pattern and also slurred. This is an important pattern because it's going to form the basis of the following section where the left hand then moves into. Now you can probably see to get the accentuation right, I'm putting a lot of weight into my fifth finger, a lot of arm weight there, but my thumb springs up very lightly. So you can hear this driving. You know, whatever I play, you get this drive on the fifth finger. Wonderful for strengthening the fifth finger. It needs to be firm, it needs to be in a good position so it's not going to collapse under the weight of the arm. So, all of that will move through the second section. So, what I'd like to do now, perhaps, is play the third section where you'll hear a lot of that left hand pattern, still combining with the right hand uh, syncopation and accentuation. And then I'm going to go back because there's um, a repeat and a DS at the end of the second line on the second page. We're going to go back. Back. I'm also going to drop the dynamic. It doesn't say drop the dynamic at the at bar nine, but actually it's quite effective just to colour the music by adding a little bit of dynamic flavour there. So I'm now going to play from the top of the second page. really helps to lighten the mood just for that moment. I like it if the left hand drops right down there and then you can still have the sense of the right hand projecting on top. You can play with the balance of the texture. And at the end, I think I got a little bit unrhythmic at the end. I was excited when I came to do that. But there's no reason why that shouldn't have that big sense of impulse if you want to go on. You're going somewhere and then suddenly it just stops and you take a big breath. It's almost as like if you haven't breathed. Always check your breathing, by the way. But really, you go through that and it's a marvellous sort of breathtaking experience. As if you've jumped into a swimming pool and it's just caught your breath and you're going to sweep away with it. So that's probably all I should say on that piece. Otherwise, we're not going to get through the eight pieces, are we? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how it's so easy to get carried away and to get really excited by that though. Um, that's lovely. Thank you so much. And you know, what I, and this is what I really loved about the last time that you, um, you did a, a webinar with us from initial to grade five, um, is, the, is the way you use imagery and the way it, you, you just bring everything into full colour. Um, and again, for those of you who are listening, and maybe even you're listening to the replay, if you go across to our, our YouTube channel, um, The Curious Piano Teachers, you'll be able to watch the, the replay for that, um, for the initial to grade five um, 
as well, which I'm sure many of you will find really useful because it was a super, another super webinar. So just I'm going to say, if you've got any questions, I mean, I think we have, I don't think we've got any specific questions um, as yet. I know Megan says, I have a pupil who's deciding between um, this and in dreams. So I think, we, Peter, we can simply say, let's, let's move on to the next one. And again, guys, just if you've got questions, please just keep them coming in. That's fine. Um, thank you for mentioning um, that. It's, it's sort of a, a way I have of imagining the music, isn't it, through these sort of strange images. Uh, but I have to apologise because that's a good thing, I know. But when I'm playing and talking, my, my playing is often is not very stabilised. So I go back and you hear all sorts of strange things. It might get a little bit unrhythmic. There might be alien notes. And I apologise for those in advance. <laughs> and we're coming right, okay. on to it very shortly so that's so who, whoever's going to make that choice uh, they have that uh, pleasure to come but i'm oh, not going to move on to uh mazurka because um again i think this would have been a, a little known piece and perhaps the the composer who's a composer educationalist from france natalie bella tagreen i think she's not so well known in this country and this is a rather lovely piece because we know mazurka say from the vast output of Chopin or Szymanowski, for instance. But here we have something which is a, a lovely introduction, a lovely stepping stone to perhaps the more mature uh, mazurkas of Chopin. I'm going to play the whole of the first page because that encapsulates the opening section, which is very mazurka-like, and you'll hear how she's been able to craft the piece with a uh, lot of lovely references to the mazurka characteristics, a typical left hand pattern, which you would immediately recognize, and also, which is specific to the mazurka dance rhythms, is the emphasis um, on unexpected beats of the bar. We have accents where we're not expecting them. You might find an accent on a second beat, you know, of the famous Chopin mazurka. Here, there's, a, there's quite an emphasis on the third beat. So you'll hear this interesting, it's almost like taking a leap out of the, the previous composer's piece where he's, he wants to syncopate the last beat of the bar. And it's not a syncopation here, but there's a definite emphasis on that particular beat of the bar. And dotted rhythms, of course, are very prevalent. So you'll hear lots of the things that you would expect from a mazurka style. The first two lines constitutes the opening section. The next two lines would be a middle section. And so you get a contrasting theme. And it's very interesting the way the hands combine and uh, uh, especially the way the right hand snakes around in this rather chromatic mode over the top. So here's the first half of the piece. <laughs> the essence of the piece and you can hear the flavor at the start. I love that she's written avec panache at the top of the piece. Panache, it even sounds delightful doesn't it? What a word to uh, articulate in your mouth and panache is a very favorite word amongst examiners. They like to write that on exam reports because if you've if you're able to play with the bullions panache, it really means you've caught the essence of the piece of music. And my goodness me, this is an exciting piece of music. You can't help but think of those um, dancers with wonderful, colorful uh, costumes on, going through the quicker movements of the mazurka. So again, articulation is very, very important. Uh, there's a lot of pedaling in this piece, but it does need still to be articulated because the articulation in the right hand will st still come through the attack in the notes, even though you have pedaling. Pedaling is also interesting. While well, we mentioned that, you can see at the beginning and in the uh, second page, uh, the pedaling is how we might describe direct pedaling. So you're going to go down on the first beat of the bar and then it's released on the third beat of the bar. So it's a down up with the left hand action. When you come to the middle section, uh, this would be referred to as legato pedaling. If I slow it down, and then it's an up-down movement on the beat. It's a very, very different sound altogether. The articulation 
is enormously important uh, in the first and last sections. It's rather nice to note the accent over the anacrusis at the beginning. And for me, that's almost um, a dramatic gesture in, its, it, in itself. It's almost as if you want to hold the music back, not going into but just allowing the air to suspend. And it really gives you that wonderful impetus if you can just dare to hold on for the the sort of nanosecond extra that will give it that sense of push into the music. The dotted rhythm should be very, very crisp. <laughs> Absolutely vital to keep the tautness in the, the rhythmic fabric. Um, again, listen now for those third beat accents. I'm going to overdo them this time so they just become a little more noticeable. <laughs> At first they feel quite strange because it's just not what you're expecting to put the accent. It doesn't mean to say, however, the left hand starts to become weak on the first beat. You still need a solid underpinning there before you apply the other accentuation. But allowing that third beat accent gives it a sense of, I don't know, that it's not quite sort of symmetrical all the way through. You get this feeling of um, uh, the rhythm being off almost, you know, so it just gives it that edge once more. I keep using the word edge, but uh, it certainly has that. Now, the, the middle section um, needs quite careful uh, practice because the right hand patterns feel rather strange against the left hand crotchet beat. So it's worthwhile tackling that very slowly, ensuring that you have the right hand pattern established within your fingers and then coordinating it and getting used to the way that feels. It is a little bit of an odd feeling at first. I love the fourth line because there you're coming to the end of the middle section. You have this augmented uh, sixth chord and suddenly this, I call it a sneaky chromatic ascent in the right hand. It's a charming moment. If I play from bar 12, it's like cartoon music just for a moment, I think. It's absolutely sort of riddled with imagery. There's a great chance that when you start the middle section, you will increase in volume. It's getting higher in pitch, and it's, it's quite difficult not to get a little bit louder there. If you do, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's not rising up to a forte, but it is important, however, that you drop down at bar 12. Make sure you go down to piano again, so you can build up to this wonderful uh, crescendo on the fourth line. The final section of the piece is uh, where you play with a big fortissimo. This is absolutely um, maximum sort of effort, if you like. The melody line is an, uh, uh, ornamented by little grace notes. And then at the end, you have this flashy crescendo as it gets higher and higher. And then three final chords, which should be played with a sort of abandon. I'm gonna play just the final section now. that you know it needs that sense of oh my goodness me it just matters to me and noise at the end I'm going to assert myself there and it needs that confidence okay that's enough on Mazurka I think that's a, that's a great piece there Peter and and this uh. word confidence and panache actually sum it up you, you you can't be be mousy about it can you you've just got to kind of go for that <laughs> and what, what I like is that it's actually a worthy piece because sometimes you will yeah. find I'm going to say cheap imitations of no, the result. No, no. Yeah. This is written, you know, it's right for this level. Absolutely. It's not, it's not massively musically mature. You know, it's not like some of the, the more subtle moments that you need to be able to express in the Chopin uh, mazurka. But everything is there and it's lovely to express that confidence in your tonal control. Mm. Yeah. And I'm very impressed and very pleased that, uh, that we actually made this discovery and this mm. composer. Mm. Quite, quite 
quite uh, complex rhythmically in a way. You've got to be very certain of the differences. You know, you've got your triplets and then you've got those semi-quavers and, as you say, the really crisp uh, dotted quaver, mm -hmm. semi-quaver rhythm. No, I think there's a lot of value in that, actually. Excellent. Thank you. We better move on, hadn't we? Because otherwise we are going to run out of time. <laughs> yes. Over to you. Um, I I mean, can you imagine what I've got to say when I get to grade eight? When you to go on to one, is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, we're coming to in dreams, which I probably need just to calm down, to be honest. But uh, at least with this piece, uh, I think many people will know to many people who have seen the Lord of the Rings films. We know this as an orchestral piece of, of great beauty, really, uh, the piece by Howard Shaw. Um, again, I'm impressed with this piece because it's obviously a piano arrangement of something that was written for an orchestra. And this is wonderful for the pianist because so much about the musician's life, and particularly the pianist's life and craft, is being able to create colour and combinations of colour on the piano. And this is the most wonderful uh, vehicle, I think, to achieve that. Um, knowing something of the original helps to create that colour. I'm going to play the introduction and then some of the, the next section. The introduction, I think, um, it needs to have a calmness about it but it also needs to have momentum, otherwise it can actually feel as though it's not going anywhere, it's not actually introducing anything. The other thing to watch is that you need to try to think carefully about tempi, because if I can ju just jump straight on to where the main tune comes in, in bar five, we need to think, what is the, the speed that we want this to be flowing at? seem like a good speed. I don't know whether that affects you, but uh, 74. But to me, that feels right for the flow of this music. So you bear that in mind, and then you can regulate your opening to make sure that is going to match. Because it could be possible, perhaps, it's called in dreams, and you could maybe get a bit too dreamy, you know, at the beginning. And it won't take you anywhere, and it won't necessarily relate to what's going to come next. So let's hope we can match these two together. musically satisfying place to finish but that leaves you just hanging on that C major chord. But there did you see how I tried uh, to create the atmosphere at the beginning yet I, I kept the momentum there was a little bit of flexibility and certainly as I came to that ascent which sort of goes right up to the stratosphere of the piano I allowed the music to just tail off because there the listeners thinking ah oh, what's happening now? What, what can I expect next? And there you've got this stasis, and it just, and you bring it to a close. And then, be slightly daring. Just wait a fraction longer before you come in with your new colour. Don't just do your ending. You know, and then. It doesn't have a dramatic statement to make. So give yourself a fraction longer, and then allow the tune to come in. So can we think, perhaps, of long string lines with a lovely sonority. So much easier on a string instrument because they will be able to sustain the sounds. The piano, you need to voice the chords. To give it that sonority, there's got to be a clear sense of this melodic content. So despite the chords underneath, that must sing out very clearly. So what might have 
appear to be quite simple on the page requires an enormous amount of tonal control and a great deal of independence and strength in fingers three, four, and five, so that you're able to project that sound. Now, I'm just going to push us on slightly because one of the lovely moments is on the next page where you perhaps can hear the horns coming out. If I just uh, approach this from bar 19 at the bottom of the first page. You know, you just feel the insides crumbling away, this music, the harmony has such a massive impact on the emotions. It's a wonderful piece, it's a very good arrangement. We would only choose it if it was a good arrangement. Arrangements are always can be iffy things, so it's got to be good, and this works very, very well indeed. So um, all of the pieces I played from grade six I, I recommend highly for different reasons. Okay. Lovely, thank you, Peter. Love the way you just described that. Again, I, I love the way you use words, melts into E major, just, just lovely. I'm still melting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm just looking at a few comments here. Um, Julie enjoyed the point that you made um, about easier to, to uh, again, to think about the tune um, being played uh, with uh, using a stringed instrument. Um, okay, so I think I don't think we've got any questions. No. Um, so let's let's just keep moving on. So I enter grade seven. Grade seven. And I'm I'm turning to um, the piece called Etude in A minor. I won't attempt to say the name of the composer of this piece. I'm sure that be some some great fun having. Uh, uh, I go to pronouncing this name. He's not a well-known composer. Um, however, he had very, very well-known teachers um, amongst whom was Liszt. So he has a very, very good pedigree. Now, this um, etude in A minor, let me just play the first um, two lines of this to give you a flavor of it. <laughs> It's elegant. It's in three times, so it will have that uh, lovely essence of a dance style. Anything that's in three time will dance. You might have a slow dance, it might have a fast dance, but this has a lovely lilt to it, and we need to feel that. It would be so easy to get bogged down with playing all the right notes. And of course, an enormous amount of preparation work has to go into a piece like this. So you're looking at the finger patterns. It's so important to establish early on whether you're going to use five three or five the fingering suggested here uh, should work for many hands, so look at that carefully and please stick to the finger because when a piece moves at such a speed, you need to know that fingering is programmed into your fingers and it's going to be reliable every time. Um, building up features, you know, obviously dotted rhythms, which we all know will be a very, very good way of increasing the uh, speed here and ensuring that the finger patterns are quite solid. Also, building up in small groups. And then. There's so much you can do to break it up and to, you deconstruct it, and then you're constructing it again. So you're actually allowing your fingers time to absorb what's going on and to build up fluency and speed in a controlled way. So do think about different ways of practicing that. Now, looking at it from an interpretational point of view, uh, clearly phrase structure, phrasing, shapes, tonal sections, these are all things that are key to this piece. 
when I first played it for you, um, I, I was almost quite excessive in the way I used my dynamics. dynamics. So I started loudly, and then I, I was able to let it drop right down, and then bars three and four, you could feel the swell. We really are dealing with waves of sound here. <laughs> is so fluid. Doesn't it remind you also of this? Sort of it's so like that, isn't it? And it's not the same fluidity, it's not as demanding as that, but it's the same essence. And um, you would wonder, perhaps, would the, um, the composer have been um, influenced by Schubert in the way the phrases um, are shaped. Um, I think I'm going to just jump on quickly to the middle section, but another note about uh, pedaling. Here we have on the first place the direct pedaling I was talking about in the berserker, where the pedaling is aligned to the left hand pattern. Down, up, down. So it literally is direct with the beat. Ensure that the, the end of the bar, where you have a slur, is very gently placed. The left hand does have some leaping around, so you've got to be very secure with that to ensure that, that remains in the background and yet an adequate support for the right hand. Moving into the middle section, it's quite different. It becomes more chordal. The pedaling is now legato pedaling. We've got to be careful that the, the feeling of the piece doesn't become stodgy here. So actually it links with what we've just been saying in dreams um, because it requires the notes of the chord, the top notes to be voiced. So we don't want to hear solid blocks of chord, that's going to sound very hymn tune-like. Not that there's anything wrong with hymn tunes, but there's a tendency just to play lots of chords and not really sing out. But here we need to have that sense on the top, there is a melody which needs to be pulled up. Uh, so allow that to have its own shape, um, move through the middle section, it comes to a close rather nicely in the final bar of the second page. And then back to the middle of the first section. But now for the first time it's marked piano. So it's important that we recognise that. At the beginning you have quite sort of strong sections and here it's very gentle. So a very, very different aspect to it. But we have a nice bright finish uh, ultimately there. Okay, um, I think, shall I just go on to the next piece? Is that the best thing to do now? And then I can just sort of get through. I'm going to completely change the mood and have a look on page 18. We have a piece by uh, Joaquin Chorina, a fiesta, which is quite well uh, known as a piano piece, two piano pieces from his set of miniatures. This is just, again, a piece needing verb, energy, color, and so many surprises await the performer and the listener. Uh, so, lots of close finger work in this. At the opening, we have something which emulates the plucking of a guitar. As you can see, my hand is really not lifting at all. It is just that closeness of the finger work. And I am adhering to the fingering the 3 2 one It's only by doing the 3 2 one that I can get that real control, but yet a freedom in my arm. If I'm using one finger, it can get more brittle and actually you start to stiffen that much more easily. So it's essential to have that. And also you feel straight away the metrical logic of this piece. One, two, one, two. It's like a motoric thing which starts to drive. And then and then we go into dance mode, but fingers very, very close to it. And back to dance. Darker moves. At that moment, you're E flat major, and you feel as though uh, there's 
a ray of sort of the sun has just emerged from behind a cloud again. But you see how quickly the landscape is changing. Uh, it's hardly time for the performer to catch up. I may be playing this a touch faster than it's marked in the book. Um, but so it can go, you know, it can be a little more sedate. But it does, it, it goes so well when you're giving it that impetus. Did you notice when I played on the bottom line of the first page, I was a little freer with this song like, this is almost like the singer being sort of introduced to the scene. It can have a slight air of improvisation about it. It's also useful to have that freedom because it will allow you some time to insert the grace notes. Carry on after. I'm going to go back to the E flat major bit. So building up, absolutely sparkling here, and then it tumbles down like acrobat. Then the final rocket. I love it, and I hope you will do too. It's just great, and there's so many um, young people out there who are going to engage. Well, not young people, old people as well. We all engage with the colour of that piece. It's just such fantastic fun to play and to perform. It's having a piece which is fun to learn, and then knowing that you're still going to enjoy it when you come to perform it. Shall I go on? I think so. Sally, did you want to, I mean, I know we have, we have one question um, that's come in from Alison. Um, she is a student learning in dreams at the minute. Um, she says he is left-handed and voicing in right hand um, can be a bit of an issue. Um, any tips to help strengthen those fingers? He's a 12 year old. This is in where we come to. in what I was talking before about, about the melody line. It's, the issues here, of course, is, is that the, the, the melody line and some accompaniment is taken with the right hand. So I think it's important that you teach the hand to be able to play the melody line without any of the chords in that hand, but ensuring that you use the fingering that you would do when the chords are in place. So that actually you're teaching the fingers to respond in a way that they would when they're playing the yes. chords. Now some of the chords are going to be a lot more difficult than others. This one here, because the F sharp and D with less strong fingers, it can be an issue to project the upper note. Now there's nothing wrong really with taking chords out and just practicing. If I take the third, major third for instance, and just practicing staggering the notes slightly so we get the tone we want there and then the note underneath very very gently so you're teaching the two parts of the hand to play in the way that's required and then eventually you bring them closer together in doing that you're actually teaching the fingers exactly what to do and that's one way about that it's quite um uh, let's say you need to persevere with that it's not something that's going to come Overnight, but you can do it with normal chords, you know, the third and move the scale, just taking D major scale because that's the piece, and just moving up and practicing doing chords in different positions and strengthening different parts of the hand, and also keeping your thumb very, very light. Like that, you can always get used to playing very gently underneath, but the arm weight has traveled into the upper note. It's also important. That there's a relaxation. So when I strike the notes, I'm already free. I'm not rigidly into that note. So that there are many aspects, which is why the piece is quite demanding. Because on paper it looks reasonably straightforward, as I said before. But it's all about chord voicing. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot to teach the hand to individualise itself. The left hand, of course, is independent from that, but some people may still have difficulty you know, making that quiet. And as it goes down to these, it can sound very gruff on the piano. Mm -hmm. So you have to have an extremely balanced use of the way 
points there, the wrists should be flexible, but the fingers should be very, very firm, so that we know the notes are going to go down together and with a controlled tone of consistency. Uh, can I just, I think those, those, those are all really, really great ideas. Can I just add one other to it? And that is that you could try playing, as you play the chord, you play the top note maybe four times. So you, you repeat each of the top notes more than you play the bottom note. You hold the D and you play the F sharp and you go, dum, 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 dum. dum. Then you change the chord and you keep playing the top note four times. And that will just help to get a little bit more strength into the finger as well. But it's and about listening, actually, isn't it? As much as anything. Yeah. It, it, I mean, we always say that really you should play the piano more with your ears than your fingers. Yeah. Because what you hear, if you're not listening, you'll never learn. Yeah. You'll be tied into the listening process. But the, the final thing, and this is where people do slip up, they're not always consistent with their fingering. I mean, I would say that there's not a great deal of feeling this because it, it, it needs to be perhaps personalised to, to a particular hand. You know you're going to be using the pedal, so sometimes you can actually lift up need to to move don't try and hold everything on with your finger don't try and achieve all of the blood your fingers. but more than anything else always stick to the same thing so if you're going to do it starting on one like that make sure it's always one two three mm -hmm. ensure that that is a feeling that you're not going to deviate from i mean i have to say it time and time and time again people um slip in piano playing people are not secure with their technique because they haven't bottomed their fingering and they haven't stuck to it. they haven't really thought about the fingering enough and it's it's by far one of the most important things that you need to sort out when you're learning a piece and um i wouldn't mind you know a glass of straw coffee and every finger being fingered because at least i can see that has been considered mm. it's not a, it's not a shape it's right on the music no it's a tool to learn yes. so right fingering in, and, and be quite ashamed of yourself if you don't stick to it, because it's such a shocking thing if you don't use the finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we better move on because um, we are going to run if we're not I'm careful. Shall I pop onto the grade eight? I think uh, that would, I think that would be a good plan. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, and I'm, I won't. Sorry, I'm shocked. Aren't I? I'm going to play the beginning of the other piece that I wanted to play because it, it, I think it won't be played very much. It's going to be neglected. Um, it's called Aftermath by the American composer Theodore Chandler. And um, <clears throat> it looks quite forbidding on the page. And I think this may put people off, but it is very beautiful. Now you have to persevere with it, but there's so much, uh, so many rewards for those who will persevere. The chromaticism is so interesting. It, it almost hints at the chromaticism of Scriabin, the late uh, romantic piano composer. The, the phrasing is wonderful, but it needs working out. And I would say anybody who attempts to play this piece should actually listen to a performance of it and get used to it as a piece of music which they hear. Because it's only when you hear it that you start to make sense of the phrasing. But just let me, let me play the first part. <laughs> Um, I love the way we have to combine the quavers in the right hand with the left hand triplets. And I love those unexpected twists in the harmony. So um, that's all I say about it. But I think it really does sort of uh, pay um, studying. And um, I think people will enjoy that because it's only, what, 21 bars. But it's 21 bars of absolute sort of complete emotional intensity. And it's a lovely piece. On to great. So I've chosen the first piece um, because we tend not to play a great deal of Rameau. So this is a lovely example of what to expect from the French Baroque. And uh, there were so many fanciful titles used in that period. Here we have a fanfarinette and la triomphante. So the first uh, part is fanfarinette um, in duple meter but compound. La Triomphante is duple meter, but it's a simple meter. So we hear straight away there's a contrast in the way the music flows. 
it's necessary in sans sarinette that the, the tempo is well gauged. Here we should have a poised flow. It should be an elegant flow. There's quite a lot of uh, crotchet quaver movement. It's so easy for these to bump. We don't want that. We need to do the same thing. This must be an elegant um, motion that runs right through uh, the movement and again gives you that dance flavor. Ornamentation is very important here. Um, you'll see that the same ornament or ornamental sign is used throughout the piece. Uh, it looks like the mordant sign, however, not always interpreted in the same way. Uh, ornamentation in the 18th century wasn't uh, completely codified, so you may see the same sign but with a different interpretation. Ornaments should always be on the beat. Um, let me play um, the first page, perhaps. <coughs> self-importance. Listen to the way it moves into uh, B minor. changes there a lot of opportunities to respond to the color of the harmony it is the harmony which will allow you to characterize the mood of this piece so I'm going to play the last four bars of that because then I want to go on to La Triomphante and we'll see if we can make a connection <laughs> So it's important that we just have the right amount of time before we go from the mood of uh, the first uh, piece into the second piece. And what a striking difference this is. It's just lovely to finish off with that calm. Or if you turn the page calmer, and then the whole thing has changed. There's a new mood completely. Um, and being a little more varied with my articulation here, there's quite a lot of sort of broken chord figure work. It's a perfect opportunity to start to use articulation. That's for you to experiment. There are many things you can do with that. Uh, but listen to the way he's phrased it and try to understand how articulation and variety on that front is going to allow uh, for contrast in music. Again, look for places where you can use dynamics. If I move on to line four, um, you'll hear some repeated passages. <laughs> Clearly, it's just a, a direct repeat. So use your dynamics. Use those things to create the interest and color in the music. Lovely piece, so, and not, not by far well enough known, I think. A lot of Rameau's music is neglected still, and I think there's so much that we could do on the piano to bring that to life. 
and I think I've got to go on, haven't I? So I'm going to very quickly. Uh, um, what oh yes, I can't. I can't not play the the what is it? Ireland. You said Elgar. <laughs> It's, it's, it's so um, English because this is a lovely pastoral style and absolutely sort of exuding uh, what we think of as being typically English, uh, just what we'd expect from Ireland. The lovely key of D flat major, this has a glow, a warmth about it. Uh, this is for the performer who has quite a good hand span because we're back to in dreams in a way because so much of this has to be voice. It's thick textures, but there's so much there going on orchestrally. So let's think in terms of different colors. Let's think in terms of lovely string passages, little oboe interpolations, and how we can really allow this music to uh, really explore the full gamut of what the, the piano is capable of. Can I jump into, it modulates the dominant in bar 11, and then immediately you have a middle section so listen to how the melody has gone into what I would like to think of as the sonorous cello uh, section of the orchestra. for the first time, you could experiment with the Eula Corda, give it that it's quite excessive on this piano, but it, again it's worth looking at the colours, let's look at what the piano can do for us, if there's a colour that we need and we can use that pedal, let's consider it. I better stop haven't I? Okay, so I, um, I haven't said everything I want to say, but at least I have covered all the pieces I want in one way or another and um, uh, and I've enjoyed playing them immensely. Not always very well, I appreciate. But I hope I've been able to uh, show you my ideas. And I hope I've been able to show you ways of thinking about music. A lot of today has not been specifically about technique, but more about how you can interpret and how you can use your technique to create the colours. In the higher grades, it's got to be colour and phrasing, structure. These things are paramount in putting a piece together. No, it's it's been utterly inspiring, actually, Peter, and to sit and listen to you uh, literally rhapsodise about the pieces and bring them to life. It, it's just wonderful. You know, I just sit here going, oh, wonderful. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Internet isn't great sometimes at picking up the piano, but but it beautiful playing. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, just leaving us with that exquisite moment in bar 22 of that bridge, that E flat against that F, what I call sort of a squelchy chord. Heart melting. Heart melting. Um, but aren't we just lucky? A, we're oh, lucky to be musicians and we have this. This is our life. Yes, this is our life. Yeah, and it's the truth. Secondly, we are teachers and we're able to transmit this and be able to pass this on. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> It's almost quite emotional, really, isn't it? It, it, it is. Uh, it absolutely, surely you know, is. Don't yeah. sit down and think about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But it's a remarkable thing we do. And all you people out there, you know, you carry on doing it. Because mm -hmm. you're all doing a job. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it, it is a remarkable thing, really. And, and that, you know, that music helps you to sort of come to terms with things, really. It helps you to make sense of life, you know. Um, yeah. 
very good and yes simon Locke is saying very enlightening and informative so and Thanks. susan anderson really useful and thoughtful ideas for us all to use and i think that's ab absolutely right and also just sh you know um sharing with us this different different music again being pianists we're very lucky because our repertoire is so enormous and sometimes we get stuck don't we by using the same pieces over and over again because they're familiar and we know what to do with them but there is so much other stuff out there and i think it's one of the real joys of 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 the exam boards and the different syllabuses that you come out syllabi that you come out with you know is that we get to find out about that mm. ramo piece well i love ramo but i hadn't really come across that one before so really thank you so much for all mm. that you do and everybody does at trinity thank you very much absolutely um Rhea has just said wonderful so glad i tuned in um yvonne saying thank you i discovered some lovely pieces this morning i feel inspired to learn some of them myself uh, some great practice and teaching tips too and i know that alison has said thank you uh, for the advice that you uh, shared as well um, and Emily saying thank you so much for your time and knowledge so yes Peter we just want to reiterate that and say another mm. huge thank you I know guys we have been kind of squeezed for time we do these 60 minute webinars and there's only so much you can do in 60 minutes but Peter you've done a great job at just again yeah. inspiring us and enthusing us again this morning so just want to clarify that uh, the you'll be receiving within probably the next 24 hours um, an email um, if you've registered for this call or if you're on the live call um, so you'll get the replay video um, if you would like to hear Peter um, again do the similar thing for initial up to grade five go across to YouTube type us in the curious piano teachers uh, and you can watch that replay as well. And the other thing I just want to say is that from uh, the last webinar that we did um, with uh, with Trinity and with Peter, there were a lot. There was a lot of interest in digging into the improvisation component that um, the Trinity has. So we did say, okay, it's, that's that's for sure. That's a separate webinar. So we haven't got a date just yet, but we are definitely going to do that because we know that there's a huge amount of interest. Um, you, again, you want. Um, a webinar from uh, from Peter at Trinity just to kind of walk us through that so that will be something separate to look out for if you're not on our emailing list um, you might be watching this on YouTube you haven't subscribed go across to your website um, and if you look at the contact place there you can subscribe there to um, to our mailing list and you will then get automatic um, access to when that's 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 gonna be happening um, go across to our Facebook page we're on Instagram we're on Twitter um, and again, the, what we love to do is we love to share and inspire um, piano teachers. We love to get experts such as Peter uh, to come and to share. And because again, if we're in our own four walls, in our own studios, we can get a very kind of blinkered. And it just takes something like 60 minutes with Peter Wilde for us to go, yes. I'm off to the piano to, to, to explore this music. So Peter, I just want to again say a huge thank you um, for, uh, for being with us this morning. Um, I know that Anna's in the background there. Uh, thank you so much to Anna. <laughs> well, we have a Sally in the background too. So Sally, thank you for being with us too. And thank you to everyone who has registered and who has been here on the live call today. Uh, thank you so, so much. And uh, have a great teaching day. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.